Blog Talk Radio. of a night in heaven is a thousand years on earth it feels like a thousand years since you left this place and I'd do anything just to see your face again I know never told you enough how much you meant to me if I could do it all over again you'd hear it every day but there's no going back those mistakes are in the past How many times could I have said that you're my best friend? How many days could I have spent getting you to comprehend? This life is going to end And I'd be without you, my
Chad, you there? Yeah. Okay. Ann, are you there? I don't think I'm there. Yep, I don't know where we are. Oh, there you are. Okay. You guys are connected, so go ahead and go with the show. <laughs> Oh, wow, that was really scary. I was freaking out. <laughs> what? Well, we're live, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yvonne with, with Off the Chain. My guest host, Ian Bush, is taking over the show. I just had to take care of some technical difficulties. What you didn't do, Ian, was hit the microphone to when Chad called in. Oh. You have to hit the little microphone. Well, this is <laughs> so why. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I'm going to go and let you guys run the show. <laughs> <laughs> Good so go lord, and, that was scary See, it happens, there's technical difficulties So you guys go ahead and do the show And you've got it <laughs> Thank you so much, Yvonne We appreciate that Okay, honey, bye-bye bye. See Well, good evening, Chad How you doing? <laughs> hey, Ian, how you doing, man? Uh, I can't can't complain now that we're uh, actually connected and technical difficulties are behind us now. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to say I appreciate you allowing me to interview to interview you tonight, and I, I'm definitely have been looking forward to it. So yeah, thanks for yeah. I'm glad that uh, it's kind of cool that um, you're taking over tonight, and it should be interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's already been interesting. We've had a couple of minutes of dead air, so that'll definitely put people on uh, on, uh, on a confusing horrible music. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so we're going to talk mainly about you have a new book coming out, correct? Or it's already out? Uh, well, I have one coming out. Uh, are you talking about the book? That, uh, I have one coming out next month. Mhm. And uh there's that one coming out and then there's I just had one come out in April. Which is the one that I think you Starting the Sheets came out in April through Bloodshot Books. Yeah. Yeah. So how what what kind of feedback have you got so far about that? Um really well. People seem to really like it. It's uh, uh I think by now um, with Wallflower and Fostrums and Flies, and now with Dream Seats, they're all kind of, they're all kind of not necessarily classified as horror, but more like uh, kind of like dark fiction with real somber elements to them. And so I think by now people kind of know what to expect from me a little bit maybe. But uh, then again, with this new one, they they might not, they might not like it at all. So we'll have to see. But yeah, I got really good reception, and um, um, people seem to, uh, yeah, just really enjoy it, and uh, that makes me happy. And that's it. I was really uh, fortunate that you allowed me to get a little sneak peek on it so we could talk about it tonight. So there's a couple of things that I read that I'd love to talk about with, uh, with you tonight in regards to the book. So mm-hmm. your forward was from John Bowden. Yep. And he states how you hit a catalyst, a gear changing mechanism, and he calls you a special writer that hasn't even warmed up yet. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a, that's a pretty good compliment. So my question for you is, what happened that you hit this catalyst? You hit this gear changing mechanism. What are you warming up to? What's your next mountain that you're trying to hit too? Um. Uh, I don't know. I think that uh, I think I think uh, some of the stuff that I've been reading is partially responsible for um, my prose changing. I think some of my uh, later stuff and most recent stuff, while my ideas have kind of stayed the same, um, my prose has changed a little bit. It's gotten uh, leaner and um, I, I I I think that John is just uh I've known John for I uh, going on three years now, I think we met online and we're kinda like uh best uh online author friends. We read each other's uh, stuff. Pretty much nothing is written. Um 
that the other doesn't read. And we're very honest about our feedback and stuff, which is very helpful. And so I, I, he has kind of seen me grown over the past, uh, I guess, actually more like four years ever since I, soon after I put like, uh, soon after I put my, my uh, collection out, um, which is the first thing that I published. And so, he, you know, he's seen me grow and, and, so that's probably why he's, you know, he's known as that. But I think some of the books that I've been reading um, have helped with that. Um, I, there was a lot of, there's a couple authors that I that I really, really, truly admire. And in a sense, uh, it's not it's not that I try to emulate them. It's just that I feel a real strong connection with a couple of them because I feel like um, not only do we have some of the same kind of writing habits, but we 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 approach writing kind of the same way. And and um, one of them would be like Joe Lansdale, one of my all-time favorite authors. And he doesn't, you know, he writes westerns, he writes horror, he writes splatterpunk, and he writes, um, you know, like detective type stuff and, and like Happen Leonard. Um, and so he's not. That's always that's what I always wanted to do as a writer. I never wanted to be boxed into one thing. I never wanted to be, you know, like everything that I do I was going to be this you know, horror thing. And so early on, I made mm-hmm. the decision to <clears throat> try to stay out of that box. Um, uh, so, uh, but try to appease people who read that kind of thing. Like, horror fans love Joe Lansdale. I mean, they will, people who don't even like Westerns, they will read one of his Westerns and love it because of the way the man writes. He just has this mm-hmm. certain attitude and charm in, in his prose and this wit um, that um, I guess I, I like I, I again it's not like that I'm trying to emulate it I just feel like it's kind of already there and that um, mm-hmm. kind of like when you meet somebody and you, you feel like you have something in common so you grow this bond or whatever not that I, I don't know Joe Lansdale but I, I, I see a lot of the similarities already there so I cling to him and his writing because it um it feeds my own. So I've been reading a lot more than more of him than I have in the past. So maybe that has something to do with it. You actually brought up a good point too, is what we read is kind of what kind of guides what we write. So yeah. we, we get little bits and pieces of inspiration from everything that we read. So if you read stories that are of a different genre, of course you're going to start writing in a different genre genre because that's, that's what you're reading. So that's kind of cool that you kind of stepped out of your comfort zone just a little bit and it actually worked out really well for you. So while reading the book, um, I was surprised that you write about some really hard feelings and Mm -hmm. you have a very fitting voice for an old man. So have you, (laughs) my, my question, which is actually half question, half concern, because we've known each other for a little bit, have you turned uh, into the uh, get off my lawn? Very much so. I, I yes, <laughs> I must admit, and I blame my son, my my oldest boy, in his uh, rebellious years that he's hopefully uh, just about over with, and and it is mostly over with. But through that um, was a tough time, and I started hating people in general. And then I mean, you live on the same planet as I do. It's not hard to dislike people, you know, um, <laughs> especially when you have internet access and social media, it's, um, but yeah, I, I have become kind of, I, I joke with everybody and with myself that I'm a grumpy old man because, uh, <laughs> people just piss me off, especially young people. I don't understand them. And which is really funny for me to even consider because, I used to, you know, be a pothead. I used to be, uh, you know, and I grew up all punk rock and stuff. And I still hold on to those, like, punk rock ethics. But uh, I think that a lot of people, who, as they grow old, they start to, there are certain things that they stay in those ways, and they're not going to change from them. And I try to be as open-minded as possible, but there are some things that I just can't wrap my head around, you know, some of my son's music, like EDM music and stuff like that. I just don't, I don't get it. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, there's probably some, yeah, grumpy old man stuff. 
but when writing Emmett, I tried to just um, I tried to consider uh, what he might feel like and how alone he might feel, and just being mad at the world anyway. And you know, that's what I usually I try to put myself in the shoes of whoever you know, whatever character I'm writing about. So I guess right. um, maybe that's a compliment that, that you think I have a, a good old man voice. <laughs> <laughs> It, it it can be seen as one definitely. So when when we're also talking about this book, so we haven't really stated what it is about yet. So in your own words, could you tell the audience what the book is in your own words? Yeah, um, it's about a uh, an old man who is uh, I think he's it's been a little bit. I think he's sixty nine, seventy years old, and he has been working at a funeral home for the last forty years. Um, he's really well respected there, and his wife um, passed away a year earlier. And while he's just struggling to live day to day, um, he has a hard time with change and with letting go, and it affects him uh, deeply um, uh, to where he just doesn't. Um, he 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 has a hard time accepting to the point where he won't even sleep in the bed that his wife and him used to sleep in. So he'll sleep on the mm-hmm. couch and stuff. He doesn't, he has done nothing with her shampoos and her perfumes and stuff. Everything is the same. And he has pictures of her all over the place and just really struggles with that. And then um, one day at work, he, uh, they get a body in, at the funeral home and the, uh, it's, it's a, a, a woman in her thirties. And when he sees the body, it resembles his, uh, dead wife when she was in her 30s and mm-hmm. so things happen and it really messes with his head and so um, he just does some stuff that he um, would not otherwise do to try to uh, cope and maybe even you know have some closure with uh, with with the loss of his wife so here's here's the uh, blessing and the curse with this book ladies and gentlemen so uh, when I found out that I was going to take over the radio show tonight and I was interviewing my good friend Chad, um, I asked, he, he was like, hey, let's talk about this book. I was like, okay, great. I'll, I'll read it and I'll try to do it really good justice. I didn't have to say try. He gave it to me on Tuesday and I'm already halfway through it. So it is a phenomenal book. And it also has a lot of weird ironies to it. You're having a mortician who's dealing with his own loss when he himself has to deal with the loss of people that aren't around him. It's a really weird, ironic element of the book, if if you ask me. And you also have a lot of contrasts with the mortician being seen as sensitive and gentle if that's only skin deep because of exactly what you said. He's not He's not gentle. He's not sensitive. He's very angry um, that he mm-hmm. lost his wife the way he did. And so all these contrasts and more definitely make for an interesting way of you peeling a mystery page by page. You, for a, a lack of analogy, you literally say, oh, by the way, the sun is yellow. But wait, in a couple more pages, you tell me the sun is yellow and it's hot. And I'm like, I must know more about this yellow hot sun. Like what, what more is going to come about the sun? And you just face it out so well that you seriously have me turning way past my bedtime. So you are, you, you really have something here. You really killed it. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question is, how much did you know about this career field before you started um, writing about it? Uh, I mean, just probably not beyond what your average person knows about. Um, well, you're, you're, I guess your average horror film fan who has seen, you know, a bunch of horror films with, that, that deal with, you know, mortuary science or, or uh, you know, funeral home type stuff, and or, or if you've watched the, the series Six Feet Under. Um, stuff like that, but so I had to uh, research um, quite a lot, and so I watched a lot of videos on YouTube. On um, I didn't watch anything like super grotesque or anything like autopsies or anything, um, 
but I watched, uh, you know, like how to embalm and uh, the uh, the crematoriums and how they work and the ovens and everything. And then um, uh, there's a couple really helpful videos on um, suturing like the lips and things like that and, and different ways that you can do them and why you would do one way over the other and um, and all the different different things that they have to do for each type of different body based on decomposition. And then I joined, and I read some cool articles too, and then I joined a Facebook uh, group called, I think it was called um, Millennial... Um, <clears throat> Morti- millennial morticians or something like that and I posted mm-hmm. in the group right, and, and said right up front I am not because I knew it was just full of a bunch of business minded people you know and this is their this is their craft this is their work and I posted that I am not a mortician you know I don't work in the field <laughs> I'm writing a book um, and I stressed that I didn't want gory details I wasn't here to get off on some what was the worst thing you've ever seen kind of stuff you know I tried to be as professional yeah. as I could because I I didn't know if they'd gotten people in there before who just joined their group and be like you know what's the you know scariest thing you've seen what you know just like morbid curiosity stuff and I made it clear that that's not what I was after and, and asked if there was anyone that would be willing to let me pick their brain and like three or four girls um, sent me messages right away and said that they would uh, um, that they'd be willing to help so over the course of three, four, five months, um, uh, three of them I asked, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be writing and then I'd write all these questions down because I didn't want to, you know, bombard them like every day or something. So I would, you know, a week or two would go by and I'd, I'd send them a little list of questions. And some of the answers I would already have, but I would ask mm-hmm. them all the same thing and because I just wanted to verify that either I knew what I was talking about or, you know, how does this work? And we're talking everything from, like, the business end of it to just the mechanical stuff on how some of the stuff works, not necessarily, like, the, the gory, like, body type body type thing. Mm-hmm. And they were really super helpful and, uh, um, like, very generous with their knowledge. And they, um, I mean, a couple of them I ended up being uh, Facebook friends with, and, I, and I, they have copies of the book, and um, very nice. And what struck me as the most cool thing while we're learning all that is just how, like, tender and empathetic that these people are. They really see their work as um, not like an art form but like a service for mm-hmm. those in need, um, not, not necessarily the, the dead but the, the, the loved ones who are mourning their loss. And they really have a heart for um, they want to do the best job they can to make this uh, you know, this horrible time in these people's lives be as, you know, comforting as, as they can be. And they, they don't mm-hmm. joke around about it, you know. They don't, they, they take it very seriously. And they're not like, you know, if somebody jokes around about, of, I think some, one, one, one woman posted a pitch, pitch, a bunch of pictures, I posted a, a website link to, a bunch of pictures of a body that had decomposed after a suicide in a bathtub. And you could hardly tell it was a body, and it was just a mess. And, and the people that um, I was talking to and stuff, they spoke up, and they really let this chick have it. They were like, how dare you do that? You know, that's somebody's daughter, somebody's whatever. And, and you know, they see that kind of stuff every day. But this woman was kind of exploiting it, and they that really um, pissed them off. And so – Talking with them also helped Emmett uh, help develop Emmett's character. And if it weren't for them, frankly, some of his attributes would be different. Um, if, if it weren't for getting to kind of know them more, so that was that was probably the most uh, the, the, the cool the coolest part of it all. And I think that's the coolest thing about writing in general is that we play a bunch of characters in this world that we've never lived in, but we play it so well, and especially you do, because when I'm going through here, that's actually one of the first thoughts I'm having is, where did Chad have all this knowledge of morticians and and all that? So you play it so well that you actually play off that, hey, yeah, of course I was a mortician. Like, that's that's the vibe I got. You, You 
dive so deep into that realm that I can actually feel that you did your research. And I think most morticians would agree that you, you did due diligence to the uh, to the career field. So big kudos for for that as well. Thanks. I, I got that same kind of reaction from Wallflower when I actually had um, a handful of people ask me um, um, a couple of, in particular were convinced that I was an ex-heroin addict um, because of <laughs> how much I knew about how to do it and, you know, where to get it and, you know, and, and just the whole process of it and what it feels like and everything. And because that, that book is very thorough on, on uh, heroin use and, I had to tell them, I was like, no, I, I was like, yeah, I, I used to do some stuff when I was younger. Um, I mean, it's been decades, but I've never touched, I never touched heroin, in, in, you know, in my life. So, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't expect people to ask for, or a comment about that. And I didn't expect people to comment about um, the, you know, the mortuary science um, part, but a lot of people have, they, they were, um, for me, it wasn't something that was super important. I was more wanting to make sure that the reader had the utmost empathy for um, the protagonist all the way through the book, that no matter what he did, they would be okay with, and they would still really like him. That was my main concern. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my secondary concern was just were, were the with the little details. Um, I guess I could have just faked it, and then if anybody who knew any better read it, they could just call me out on it. But a lot of people have said, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, where, where do you learn that, and how do, how do you know that? And, and so I was like, oh, that's pretty cool that people have taken notice somewhere where I, I didn't really think that they would. Yeah. So believe it or not, we're actually halfway through our show. So at this point in time, we actually do some uh, what Yvonne would call some shameless – marketing and we have a couple of ads we gotta play so i'm gonna play those real fast and then we're gonna come back and speak to our guest chad lusky i am ian bush i am a guest uh guest host for tonight taking order for yvonne so let's play some ads real fast horses see ghosts a new poetry book by Gannat wise it's been called poetry for the rest of us, Amazon. Do you have cougars on your porch swing? <coughs> Our horse is your new best friend. <coughs> Do your nicest shoes get buried knee deep in snow as your toes turn blue? <coughs> Are you bothered by wolves at your woodpile? <coughs> no, not that kind of wolf. Join wildlife artist and author Nancy Quinn and her family as they discover an exciting new life in Go West, Young Woman, a true Montana adventure. Available online and in bookstores. Or visit quinnwildlifeart.com for a personalized signed copy. Critics agree, it's a hoot. A struggling city. Its beloved baseball team an antique camera, and photos from that camera that bear an image from the pit of hell, an entity only a select few can see. Journalism professor Buddy Cullen is determined to track this demon down. But who is the hunter and who is the prey? And who will be the next target of mankind's mortal foe? Mortal Foe, available at Amazon.com. Hi, this is Winona and Jade inviting you to join us and our wonderful guests on the And I Thought Women's Cave podcast on Blog Talk Radio to learn more about our books, the And I Thought series, and the Misfit Guides. They're available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNobles.com. Or just to see what your ladies are up to, you can find all of that out on www.andwethought.com. Dot com. So peace and love from Winona and Jade and our books. <laughs> Girl, you know, so silly. You silly. Remember Did you write that? That's funny. <laughs> Remember to visit us at andwethought.com. The year, 1888. The place, 
London's East End. Dead and mutilated bodies are popping up all over, from Stamford to Whitechapel. Jack the Ripper is leaving his mark, and the city's on edge. Yvonne Mason is back with a tale of murder and millinery. The Rhodes Hat Factory is booming while the body count rises. Why now? How are these hats connected? Has the Hatter gone mad? Mad Hatter from Yvonne Mason. Available now on Amazon.com. All right. We're back after our shameless marketing, as Yvonne would call it. So my name is Ian Bush. I'm actually the guest host for tonight's Off the Chain. Yvonne has graciously allowed me to host tonight's show with Chad Lutsky. And because of our accidental five minutes uh, communication, we uh, didn't get a chance to read his biography. So I want to do that before we start going back into this. So Chad lives in Bell Creek, Michigan, with his wife and children. For over two decades, he has been a contributor to several, several different outlets in the independent music and film scene, offering articles, reviews, and artwork. He has written for Famous Monsters of Filmland, Rue Morgue, Cemetery Dance, and Screen Magazine. His fiction can be found in a few dozen magazines and anthologies, including his own 18-story collection, Night as a Catalyst. Lutsky is known for his heartfelt dark fiction and deep character portrayals. In the summer of 2016, he released his dark coming-of-age novella of Foster Homes and Flies, which has been praised by authors Jack Ketchum, James Newman, and many others. Later in 2016, Lutsky released his contribution to best-selling author Jay Thorne's American Gaming Hunter series, and 2017 saw the release of his novella Wallflower. His latest, During the Sheets, was published by Bloodshot Books in spring of 2018. So if you didn't hear us before the uh, ads, we were talking about um, stirring the sheets and how my my longtime friend uh, confused me because I thought he took a career change and became a mortician for as well as he wrote this the story. So kind of going off on a somewhat similar path. What what's next for you? What what's what's the next Lutsky bestseller? <laughs> um. Uh, well, I've got a book coming out next month on the 14th of September called Skullface Boy. And uh, then I am, um, right now, I am writing a um, a novella with my friend John Bowden who wrote the forward to uh, Stirring the Sheets. And that is supposed to be out, I believe, around Halloween, if not on Halloween. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. We have the cover and everything. And We've been uh, plugging away at that, and it should be done soonish. And I think people are going to dig both of those. That's really great. Is there any genres that you haven't wrote yet that you're interested in? Or do you feel like you've, you've kind of reached that plateau where you're like, you know, I've done a lot, and I, I've kind of checked the box on everything that I've done so far? Um that I would be interested in, I, I'm actually, I have toyed around with the idea and actually did start something, but I, I didn't get very far in it, of writing some kind of um, just straight up drama, kind of like a Nicholas Sparks type thing, love story-ish mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Um, for some reason, I'm, I'm, I'm really big on um, like sexual tension that never really comes to fruition. Like uh, what I call... Mm-hmm. Um, platonic romance and I've got some mm-hmm. in Foster Homes and Flies uh, and I have some in Skullface Boy and I suppose I, I, uh, there's also some in Stirring the Sheets between Emmett and his neighbor Rosemary where mm-hmm. you have two people where they could potentially go further but they just maybe they don't And um, but that tension is kind you of can't, there. You and, can't ruin it for me though. I thought the brownie was the the fig leaf when she made the brownies for him. I'm like, yes, like the way to a man's heart is always food. So you've ruined it for me. I I, I, I was really hoping. Well, I, I tell you what, the the I don't really answer that uh, in, in the book. So I I I, I can't say that uh, things don't go further for them. 
But um, mm-hmm. I, there's something about uh, I just I like sexual attention, and and I hate using the word sexual because there's, uh, but but shows like it's the best example I could think of of sexual tension that I really thought really pulled it off really well is the show The Office. I don't know if you've ever watched that, but uh, mm-hmm. the, the relationship between Jim and Pam is yeah. such a heavy subplot that as funny as the show is, I mean, people really often tune in just to see if Pam and Jim are ever going to hook up. And oftentimes, mm-hmm. and there's other shows that do the same thing, and oftentimes you want them so bad to, but then when they do, you kind of wish they hadn't because then that tension is over. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in the moment that it happens, it's like, oh, it's happening. It's it's really cool. And but then once it does, it's like, well, now what? You know, now now we've <laughs> we've climbed that mountain and we're here, and that's you know now what? But there's something about that that I'm kind of attracted to. I do I do like uh, romantic films like The Notebook and stuff like that. Um, and romantic comedies, I, I don't know why. I just I, I, I do like them. Um, and I, I've toyed around with the idea of doing something like that, but I just know me, and I know that I would start writing something like that, and it would just be really dark, you know, all the way through. It would just have <laughs> some kind of really disturbing stuff in there somewhere along the line, and it would probably wouldn't come out as <laughs> how, I, how I initially set off to do. But they, that would probably be one thing that I haven't written that that I would not mind um, writing. I, at this point, I'm not really interested in like science, writing science fiction or westerns or anything like that, but um, I think that I could, I probably could pull off a western. I don't know if I could science fiction. Uh, I, I love Star Trek, but I'm not geeky like that with the whole, I watch Star Trek and I think, you know, these guys, that, the writers that do this with all their technical lingo with the spaceship and stuff I just couldn't I couldn't do that but then again I don't read any of that either I've never read any sci-fi so um, it would be a territory where I would just be not knowing what I'm doing you know it would just be this big character portrayal and it had nothing to do with any kind of mission or you know I would not be able to get into the the schematics of of everything it would just like it would just be uh Characterization and, and and that's it, I guess. <laughs> kind of, kind of a interesting thought process around that. I, I kind of agree that I never got into the too technical realm. I just like kind of the the, the surface plot, if you will. That you know, the good guy, bad guy. We have this technology. It's gonna get better. Let's mm-hmm. use it. There's all these races, so. I agree with you on that. So tomorrow on the show, we're actually going to interview Gary Starda. And one of the questions that I'm going to ask him, I actually want to ask you, um, do you, do you feel like different opportunities have presented your, has been presented to you through your art that you feel you wouldn't have if you didn't have the art? Do you feel like things have happened to you that you're like, if I never wrote a book, if I never even got my name out there, that's when it have happened. Um, I, I think mainly like the relationships that I have right now. Um, there are a handful of people that um, that I, I wish lived closer because um, I can tell that we would be. You know, and some of my I, I am good friends with, um, but I can see there's a handful of authors that that I I speak with on uh, on a regular basis or a fairly regular base, basis that you can tell that we just um, would click in uh, in the real, as John Bowden would say, and he's one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, um, my friend Dan Padavana and Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon are a couple of other guys that. I wish we all kind of lived closer. And if it wasn't for writing, I wouldn't have um, met any of them. And I value their their input. I value their relationship. And uh, um, that is the, the – there's something about the horror community, too, for the most part, that is very um, – uh, like there's a com- camaraderie there. 
and there's a willingness to uh, offer aid and help and encouragement and in whether it be spreading the word or beta reading or any of that stuff. I mean, you've got your a-holes out there too, but for the most part, um, I, I noticed that right away that this is not a contest. Everybody is rooting for you. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought that that was really neat. You know, everybody wants to see you succeed. Um, and, and for the most part, I haven't run into any kind of like, you know, jealousy. I mean, I'm sure all of us are like, we might read a book and, we, you know, how did this win a Stoker Award? My book's better kind of stuff, you know, but it's not like there's hard feelings involved um, or anything like that. It's just, but, but yeah, for the most part, um, I mean, and, and the list goes on for the, the people that, um, that, other than the ones that I just mentioned, but as far as people mm -hmm. that I, that I really um, am, am very glad that I met. Um, and yeah, it's, it's allowed for, um, yeah, just networking and meeting, meeting new people and, and, and having relationships. I think that's probably the only, um, real thing I can think of, and, and it and it feels good to. Um, I won't lie. It feels good when you get your uh, a book out there, and people um, in other countries or in other states or whatever who you don't know that you haven't had contact with before are spreading your book around and, and giving it good reviews and stuff like that. It it feels um, it feels really good, and it, it, it's not that it it's not that it feel, feeds your ego as much as it, it just um, kind of helps you um, with, with not feeling like you're wasting your time because that would be an easy trap to fall into. You know, if you don't have, like if I only wrote for myself and say my wife and she's the only one who I could get my anybody, you know, to, to read my book, um, it wouldn't last that long. But the more reviews I get and the more people pick up the book and read it and really like get it. Um, mm -hmm. I really get off on that, and it and it's what gives me the most um, encouragement to continue and to write another book and hope that um, they'll like the next one. And with each one, I get really nervous because I give these to the horror community, and I'm like, well, what if they don't? What if it's not? It's not really horror, is it? <laughs> and nobody has said a word. And um, um, you know, if you take Stirring the Sheets, for example, there is a certain route that I could have taken that maybe some authors, more extreme authors, would, and I chose not to. And um, I knew that some people, there would be some people out there that would, not not very many, but there would be some that would think that mm -hmm. this book is going into a certain direction. And um, maybe they were hoping for that, and I wasn't going to do that. But for the most part, I've, I've read a lot of reviews on um, websites and stuff for stirring the sheets that they specifically say um, that I could have gone that direction, and they're so glad that I didn't because it would have ruined the book. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, but like with this, you know, again with this next book, book coming out, Skullface Boy, I'm very nervous because the last <laughs> three books I put out were very like very heartfelt, somber things. And this is one of them too. Um, it's got Lutsky written all over it, but it also has like some weird elements that they might not be um, necessarily prepared for. I think it's the best thing I've written. Um, other people have said that too, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the masses are, are as far as it would reach or it's going to reach or whatever. They haven't uh, read it yet. So I'm, I'm anxious to see what people are going to. It's probably my least, horror, quote-unquote horror book, um, while it has mm -hmm. horrific events in it, it is not something that um, you would be like, hey, can I, you know, can you recommend a good scary book? I, I would not be able to recommend <laughs> my book. You know, but I keep right. telling myself, you know, well, Stephen King, he wrote stuff like, you know, like The Body, which is, you know, um, Stand By Me, the movie was uh, based on, and stuff like mm -hmm. that that, that not really horror, but or the Green Mile, you know, it's probably one of the most popular ones. But that that audience still uh, likes it. So when I'm sending the book off to these horror review sites and stuff, I, I get nervous each time, and, and probably the most right now because I'm like, are they gonna say what is this? This isn't horror. But I'm the one who wrote it, so I'm kind of too stand, standing too close to see, and so it might have mm -hmm. have enough 
disturbing imagery and uh, horrific events in it for them to say, yeah, this, to me, this is, you know, this could be, you know, constitutes as, as horror. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. And I can't remember the question, but hopefully I answered it. <laughs> you did. You did. You did good. Tangents are okay on off the chain. That's, 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 that's completely okay. So the reason I ask that is because I know for me as an author, um, one of the big things that I didn't even imagine happening was off the chain with Yvonne. And I actually mm-hmm. asked her before we did the show what her stats were. And she's always really big about saying it's not her stats, it's our stats. We, as a group, came together, and it, that's some of the elements that you're speaking of, is that you have other people who are rooting for you who want you to succeed. And so Yeah, well, not just me, but yeah, me, everybody, you know? Right. She told me that um, she's up to 131,000, uh, 131, and then there's 200,000 with all the podcasts in over 200 countries. Nice. nice. That's, That's awesome. something that I never even imagined, let alone, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to be heard outside the United States. I bet you didn't think you were going to be heard outside the United States. And so that's a yeah, really no. cool aspect for authors when they get to a certain point, but they can look back and say, yeah, I was a small kid from Battle Creek, Michigan, and now I've actually done something. And mm-hmm. I I know that from talking with other authors, they feel like this is a very lonely um, journey. You know, when you play a sport, you have people in the stands who are cheering for you. You don't have that when you're sitting at your desk writing, but you do have what you stated, feedback on Amazon, and that's kind of the, the fans in the stand for you while you're writing. Mm-hmm. Would Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, it certainly can be lonely, too, because um, there's something about writing and, and digging deep inside yourself and um, it is can be feel isolating, I guess. Um, but like mm-hmm. I said, if it wasn't for, you know, my, my wife is probably my biggest fan. I and mean, if she was the only one reading, though, honestly, I just would quit because, I mean, if she doesn't like something, she, she's not afraid to tell me. And sometimes, you know, <laughs> I take her suggestions. Most time I take her suggestions and sometimes I don't, you know, um, because I was like, well, you don't understand. I mean, she she has a hard a hard time, like, find, kind of seeing the big picture. You know, like when I said, mm-hmm. I've got an, I just came up with an idea for a book. And she's like, what? And I'm like, there's a kid who uh, has an abusive mother and she dies, but he doesn't do anything about it because he has a spelling bee coming up. You should have seen the look that I got, you know? And I was like, <laughs> I was like you, you don't understand. I was like, hey, trust me, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> and she's like, oh, it sounds yeah. kind of silly to me. I was like, no, it's going to be cool. Just wait. And, um, Aren't spouses the best? Yeah. You're like, okay, give me a pen and paper. I'll draw this out for you. So first week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you're when doing storyboarding in the know, living room. <laughs> yeah, but when I when I finished it, she's like, yeah, okay. But she, um, she, you know, and it's just part of like knowing, um, you know, what I'm going to do with it outside of, and then just trying to give her just a quick elevator pitch, you know, two line, you know, two sentence. Um, synopsis of, of the idea and but she had a you know she would have a hard time and I, I think she may have done that a little bit with uh stirring the sheets too I was like yeah, I'm gonna have this but I think by then she um kind of uh trusted me a little bit more but but because of that you know <laughs> she knew the that, rhythm. That feel, she's like it sounds crazy at first but he'll tell me and it'll be all off. right <laughs> yeah yeah so but yeah, I, I I totally agree, and it can be lonely. And if it, you know, like I said, if it wasn't for uh, like the horror community as a whole, you know, pulling for you and pulling for each other, um, I mean, it feels good to you know to to help other people out and spread the word and and uh, do all that, and it, it makes it feel a lot less lonely. And, and you know, you've got conventions and stuff that they, like they just have the scares that care conventions and authors meet up and stuff mm-hmm. and and sell their books and just get to know each other and things like that. And so that, that is, uh, I'm sure that helps with the, with the loneliness that can be felt as well. Yeah. So can you believe it or not, but we are actually coming to the end of our show. 
So I just want to yep. say personally, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you, interview you tonight. You didn't have to do that, and you let me uh, have a chance to do that. And I really appreciate that. And from one friend to another, I am so, so proud of you. You are reaching whole new heights, and I there's no word to describe how awesome it is that I get to see your books all the time. And I just, I appreciate you having the courage to write what you wrote for our community of authors and artists, because it's definitely making wonderful trails for others to follow. So I appreciate that. Thanks, man. I know others appreciate that. And before we go, could you sound off where you can find your art so other people can look you up? Yeah, um, every all links to everything that you might need is found at my website, chadlutzke.com, and that's C-H-A-D-L-U-T-Z-K-E. And you can find anything anything there. i got a Patreon page, and you can find a link to it there. I've got a, a reader's group that you can sign up for and get free stuff, and I'm um, free stuff to read, and I'm always giving giveaways out for audio books and paperback books and and uh you know, Kindle versions or whatever. So um, you can find all that stuff uh, at my website. And thank you, Ian. That was it was awesome that you. Um, it was it was unexpected, but it was a pleasant surprise that that you would be the one I would be chatting with tonight. I was glad. Yeah, we definitely have to catch up soon. So, as Yvonne always ends, she always ends with a little bit of a heartfelt message. Um, that's the way I want to end tonight because in the world right now, we all need a little bit more inspiration to hold us all up. So my message for you tonight is no matter what it is that you're going to do, no matter how scary it may be, just get out there and do it because you don't know how much time you have left on this world. And if you are sitting on your bed and you feel like, oh, man, I wish I could have went back there and did X. That's the thing you need to go do right now. When I asked Yvonne if I could take the shows for the week, I was petrified at the thought of speaking to all of you tonight. But then after our uh, five, ten-minute dead space, talking with Chad, knowing that you guys are listening, giving me a chance, that inspired me to keep going and say, you know what, it's scary, but it's going it's gonna to work. It's going to be okay. Because this is actually one of my biggest items that I wanted to do before my deathbed, which is hopefully many, many years down the road. So whatever it is that you need to do, no matter how scary it is, you just need to go out there and do it. And, of course, you might forget to hit that one button that starts the entire show. That's okay. You roll (laughs) the punches. You get better. You move on. So that's what I would recommend to you this week is find at least that one thing that you know that it would be your passion if you just took that first step and you take that first step. So thank you all for listening. Tomorrow we will be on off, off chain, same time, same place, and we're going to be interviewing Gary Strada. He's a former journalist who studied English and journalism at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. His love for science fiction compelled him to write his first novel, What Are You Made Of?, published in 2006, inspired by Isaac Asimov. The science fiction novel focused on intelligent artificial life and whether sentient androids should possess the same rights as humans. The androids in Strada's novel are created as hybrids, part machine, part human, further blurring the line between human and machine. Strada foresees a near future where humans will be forced to decide if intelligent machinery is indeed a life form. Possibly in this near future, some humans will possess computer enhancements to overcome disabilities, becoming hybrids themselves. The line between biological life form and mechanical life form continues to be examined in 2010's God of the Machines. I'm really excited to meet with him tomorrow, see what he has to say. But for tonight, all good things must come to an end. This has been, this has been off the chain, and my name is Ian Bush. Thank you all for allowing me to talk to you tonight. Have a good night. Thanks, Ian.